And then, you know, I, I had an injury and that thing pl uh, plagued me for quite a few years, but it finally got um, bad enough where they separated me um, right around 2000. And uh, that was kind of a shock. Um, I'm married, I've got two kids, had yeah. two kids at the time. It was really kind of a shock. And uh, yeah, it was, at that time it was, you know, you can't serve anymore. So, you know, here, here's your separation orders. You'll be gone in about 90 days. Yeah. So it was kind of a, of, of a big shock. Um, so that, that was kind of uh, my time there in regiment. Welcome to the Leading with Vulnerability podcast. I'm your host, Yuma Barnett, and today my guest is Justin Finney, former 375 Ranger, Regimental Headquarters Ranger. Um, he is currently the, I better read it so I don't mess it up, the Assistant Superintendent of Business Services and Technology. And by people around here in Harris County, Georgia, he's known affectionately as Dr. Finney. So <laughs> yeah, a former enlisted, enlisted Ranger, now to the, you know, and a places high places in the in education i i brought him on here one because i think he's he's great in this community and i think a lot of rangers or even military leaders in general would be really good transitioning out of service into education either as teachers or in an administrative role and it's a way to still continue to serve and give back to your to your community uh, and help grow the next generation of leaders in our country and I think there's a lot of people that from our organization that we both came from and the service is at large that would benefit from that and our nation would benefit from that so I'll pass it off to Justin so he can introduce himself and we'll get into the conversation well great thanks Yuma for having me I'm, I'm thrilled to be here um, and thank you for what you're doing reaching out to uh, uh, all of these people that uh, might not have anywhere else to go um, but uh, thanks for what you're doing yeah I mean my story is probably like a lot of um, people that transition out of the service and, and e even uh, the Ranger Regiment um, just to kind of give you some of my background um, I grew up in a small town out in North Texas up near Amarillo oh. and um, you know it was a farming community and so uh, you either went to college, but the big thing was to get out of there. Yeah. Uh, I, I had I had lost my interest in farming and ranching, so I'd always wanted to, to join the Army. And some of my friends had um, joined the Army, and they had went airborne. And so I enlisted with a ranger contract. I didn't really know what that meant. Um, but uh, I, I got in, went through basic training, got to Fort Benning, Georgia, went through airborne school, and... Uh, got to it was ripped then so yep. that that tells you how yeah. old i am it i went ripped. to rip too so yeah it was ripped then and uh they had too many 13 foxes i was a fire support specialist they had too many 13 foxes so they gave us station of choice wherever we wanted to go so i chose italy oh good choice. wound up in um third of the 325 um over there i was there for about four years and then i got levied back to uh i got levied back to fort benning and um i was supposed to I, I was an E5 at the time, and I was supposed to go to the airborne school, and that didn't work out. So they were going to send me to a mechanized unit oh. uh, over on Kelly Hill. Nothing against mechanized infantry, <laughs> of course, uh, but I had been light and airborne my whole time. So by chance, by accident, I ran into the uh, Ranger liaison at Clothing and Sales because his, uh, I think, Sergeant First Class Gibson, I don't know if you knew him or not, but he had a twin brother that was going to Italy. And he saw that I was coming from Italy, so we struck up a conversation, and he just asked me, he said, well, why don't you go to the Ranger Regiment? I said, well, I didn't know I could do that. Yeah. He told me he was the liaison, so he, I gave him my Social Security number right there in clothing and sales. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't think anything of, of it, and I am processed at Fort Benning. And uh, my sponsors from Kelly Hill were actually there to pick me up. Um, and they called out my, my uh, orders and said, you know, Sergeant Finney, HHC, 75th Ranger Regiment. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I was shocked, and um, so were my sponsors that were coming to get me from <laughs> oh, the 1st yeah. to the 41st. And so I wound up in regiment just kind of by accident. Yeah. And it was one of the best accidents of my life. Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, I got some of the best assignments in regiment. I got some of the best schools, and uh, it, it was just a, uh, it was just a, it was a great time. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I, I had an injury, and that thing pl uh, plagued me for quite a few years, but it finally got... Um, bad enough where they separated me um, right around 2000 and uh, that was kind of a shock um, I'm married I've got two kids had yeah. two kids at the time it was really kind of a shock and uh, yeah it was at that time it was you know you can't serve anymore so you know 
here, here's your separation orders. You'll be gone in about 90 days. Yeah. So it was kind of a, of, of a big shock. Um, so that, that was kind of, uh, my time there in regiment. Um, but some things happened, um, in that time as, as shocked as I was, I don't know if you know, Sergeant Major Jimmy Pickering. Oh, I know the name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he was my first Sergeant at the time and he, he actually, um, had been a certified teacher, I think before he came into the army and he asked me what I was going to do. Cause I had no plan. Right. I had no plan at all. And he said, have you thought about teaching? And I said, uh, not really. <laughs> he said, well, Columbus State University is registering for classes this week, and you've got three months before you get out. So you need to just go register for classes, and in that three-month period, you need to you know, get into a program. So I went, into the, went down, got into the teacher education program, and you know, the rest is uh, kind of history. Um, I taught for a few years, taught middle school. Yeah, what, what uh, subject? I taught um, social studies, science, um, did some coaching. And uh, taught a little reading, even though I wasn't a trained reading teacher. <laughs> but I taught right down here at Rothschild Middle School in Columbus. And um, from there, I got interested in educational leadership. And um, actually, for a few years, I, I was a program coordinator at Columbus State University. And then by accident, again, I wound up in Harris County Schools as an assistant principal at a middle school. Um, did that for a few years. And then I became principal at Mulberry Creek Elementary. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where you were when I met you. Yeah, that's yeah. where that's where I was when you guys uh, were there, uh, when you guys came in. And I can't believe how <laughs> <laughs> how much time has passed now that, that your kids are um, so far along, along in school now. But uh, worked my way up into uh, – I got an opportunity to go back to Department of Defense Schools here in the Southeast yeah. District. I was chief of staff for the Southeast District and then had the opportunity to come back as an assistant superintendent here at Harris County. Well, that's – yeah, so – I've, I met Doc, Dr. Finney. It's just what I say, right? It's just habit. And when I met him, I, I just assumed he was an, a former officer because he had that doctor in front of his title. <laughs> I didn't learn until we sat down here that he's a former enlisted guy just like me, which makes it even better work to the position that he's in now. Yep. And I will say, the minute we walked in the door at Mulberry Creek, you were just so in, inviting, brought us into your office, set us down. We just came back from Australia trying to in place. And I started seeing the Ranger memorabilia around your office. And I knew then my kids were in good hands and I didn't have to worry about it. But I want to back up a little bit to your time in the, in the 75th and your, okay. and your transition out, out there. So you got medically discharged yep. 11 years into service. Yep. Yeah. And pr right before nine 11. Yeah. And I knew I know other people that got out right before 9/11, either medically discharged or, or chose to separate because they just thought it was never going to happen. You know, going to the war, which now 20 years later we realized it's not as great as we thought it might be. But you had to watch 9/11 from the sidelines. How, what was that like? How did that affect you? It was painful. It was very painful. You can tell. Oh yeah, <laughs> you can tell. Um, when the Rangers jumped in that first night, I sat there in my living room. Uh -huh. and bawled my eyes out, cried like a baby. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just hoped that everybody was fine. Had no idea that that um, what, what I was watching on TV at that time was going to unfold like it did over right. the last 20 years. Uh, but, yeah, you know, missing it by just a, yeah. a little bit like that, it was, it was really painful. I can imagine. And then I'm just thinking here as somebody, you know, I know a few people that missed that missed it, you yep. know, that didn't go and you're here in this community. So you've seen the regiment for 20 years go hard at it. And in that vein, you've had hundreds probably of regimental children, uh, their dads are deploying pass through your schools here. What did that weigh on you? Did you think about that? Did it was it part of your Yeah, abs absolutely. It weighed on me for it weighed on me for quite a while, but um you know, I had some good mentors and some good faith mentors um, when I got out. And, you know, there were a lot of challenges, but, uh, you know, God blessed me in many ways. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that path you think you're going down when it's taken out from under you unexpectedly, there's a lot of shock. There's a lot of uh, fear. There's a lot of resentment. Yeah. There's a lot of guilt. But, uh, you know, I realize now that it was best. God's timing's perfect, right? And He's really blessed me uh, being able to serve in other ways than than the way I was serving, and uh, it, it wasn't easy to get to that point. But yeah. uh, I look back at it now, and and you know, God had His hands on it the whole time, right? Um, with me, 
my family and the people that I've been able to work with and, and hopefully bless right. um, in, in the same way that I've been blessed. Absolutely. I think I say it all. I think <clears throat> things happen for a reason. Mm-hmm. And maybe it happened for a reason that you were up here watching over all of us service members, yep. kids, while we were over there doing what we were doing. Yep. And, and that's... Uh, it kind of makes my heartstrings flutter a little bit there thinking about it. So that I can't I can't think of a better way to get in to ask you just what's vulnerability? What's the definition of vulnerability to to you? Well, v- vulnerability. I mean, it it conjures up a lot of emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people think. I don't think this, but I think a lot of people think weakness. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, the people that we've served with might think it's weakness. Yeah. I, I think of vulnerability as being a state in which you are open to um, harm or criticism or even ridicule. Yeah. And, and I, don't, I, I don't think those things are necessarily bad. Right. Um, um, I, I think that's just what a leader um, should be, should be vulnerable. They should be the one that is, is open for the criticism and open for the... Uh, the uh, the, the ridicule in some yeah. uh, some cases, the scrutiny. Um, they're the person that people are looking at. Um, and, uh, you know, harm could be physical harm. Harm could be emotional, reputation, yeah. those kind of things as well. So that's that's kind of the way I look at vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, and it just comes with the job. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure definitely in your yeah. position. It now, the last couple of years, uh, for sure, you've had some, <laughs> some tough decisions <laughs> to make, some tough moments to make, and we'll yeah. talk about that. So... 11 years in service, what, what was the most difficult day in service? Was that when you find out you had to separate? Yep. Yep. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people would think, you know, uh, the physical demands that we were under, um, you know, the op tempos that you, you undergo, which at that time we thought the op tempo was high. <laughs> right. <laughs> I yeah. can't imagine what it's been, yeah. um, you know, in the last 20 years. But, uh, but no, my most challenging times was actually coming to the realization that it was over, Right. that I was getting out and, and, and what in the world am I going to do afterwards? Yeah. Um, because I had no plan. Yeah. My plan was to stay in for 20 plus years yeah. and, and, and stay in regiment as long as I could. I, you know, I knew there was probably going to come a time where, you know, physical limitations would prevent me from, uh, you know, maintaining the Ranger standards, right. but, uh, that's, that's what I was going to do. And when the time came, I was, I was going to do something else in the yeah. military, but, uh, yeah, the most challenging time was that time where it was the realization that I was getting out. And I think my hardest day was, um, you know, I, I was called back, and I was I was a civilian at this point, and I'd been out a couple months, but coming back to receive my, my end-of-service award, oh, yeah. you know, that, that most people get. Um, but, you know, coming back to the same people that I was with, but it was different, yeah. um, knowing, knowing that I was not – physically part of that team any longer the team yes. yeah physically part of that team I, I felt so alone standing in that formation um getting that award and knowing you know this is this is over i no right. longer have this uh support right um that i had um with a with a whole battalion of rangers yeah um and, and you know you take for granted i think when you're there yeah you do uh, of that of that comfort and that dependability yeah um that it doesn't matter which guy yeah, you know if he's wearing that scroll, yeah. you you can depend on him. Absolutely, and, and he's he's bound by a, a a set of standards that everybody is bound by. And I learned really quick, it's not like that <laughs> when you leave. And so that that was really my toughest. Yeah. That was really my toughest day. So and, and you said a couple of really good things in there. And I I tell often to the to the rangers that I mentor that are getting out or or you know that are coming in. Someday this is going to end. Mm-hmm. The regiment's going to end. The army's going to end. Yep. And you're going to have to do something else. And in your case, it ended abruptly, mm-hmm. unexpected. What would – having a plan. Like, what's the importance of having a plan? Oh, the importance of having a plan is, is so important. Um, I, I guess I would, I would tell people, live in the moment. Appreciate what you have. Live in the moment, be present in the moment, but have a plan for the future. And right. I think sometimes on the surface that sounds dichotomous. Yeah. But uh, enjoy every minute you have with something that you love to do and that you enjoy and be present in that moment and be thankful in that moment, but knowing that someday that's probably going to end and have some goals and some dreams that you can pursue um, in the future. Um, That's so important. It is. And so when you transitioned out, you went and got your um, undergrad Mm -hmm. for for teaching and and education, Um, that, that path 
I think a lot of people kind of know that path, but what's the path into education administration side? What, what's that educational path? Kind of so usually like? the path into educational administration is um, most school administrators, at least in the public sector, are um, teachers first. Right. And I always recommend people become teachers first because that makes you a better educational leader because you know what the teachers are going through. You know what the... Uh, what the rigors are yeah. in the classroom with all that teachers have to deal with. And um, I, I loved being a teacher. Um, some days I think I would like to go back to being t- a, a teacher. <laughs> it's kind of like when you're a platoon sergeant yeah, and yeah. you're like, yeah, it's great, but man, I would like to be a private for a well, day. Well, when I always considered myself as a squad leader and as a platoon sergeant, I always considered myself a teacher. Right. Oh, and, yeah. And, and so that's why I think those skills, a lot of them are transferable. Um, and that's why I always... I always ask people that are transitioning, you ever thought about teaching? So if you've got any any um, thoughts about doing that at all, yeah, get yeah. into it. But being a teacher first, getting some good teaching experience so you understand. But uh, looking at those organizations, you know, uh, educational organizations, and I, I just kind of realized, you know, I thought I was looking at my leaders at the time when I was a teacher. And not that I thought I could do it better, but I thought I can do this, right, and I've yeah. got the skills to do this, and I think I can have an impact not just working with kids, but I think I can have a good impact working with teachers and working with parents as well. So that's what really took me into the administration side of it. Yeah. And how long have you been in the administrative role? Uh, let's see. I've been in the administration role since probably 07, oh f- yeah, I guess, yeah. is when I went to Harris County Carver Middle School here yeah. as, a, as an assistant principal. So yeah. what's your, so you, what's the, like, what is the actual education? Is it, you got your master's degree and then followed up with your PhD or ED? Uh, well, I did it the e- hard PhD, way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I did it the hard way. But yeah, you get your, uh, you get certified as a teacher and you, you, you teach. And then to be um, certified as an administrator in the state of Georgia, you have to have a master's degree. Okay. Um, that would probably get you certified to be an assistant principal. Um and then usually most school districts want you to have some experience as an assistant principal uh, to become a principal. Uh, but you can become an assistant principal and a um, principal with a master's degree. There's a there's kind of an in-between degree between a master's and a uh, uh, doctorate, and that's what they call an educational specialist. Yep. And uh, it's really another master's degree, and you, you really need one of those to become a principal. Um, and, you know, a Ph.D. or a doctorate's not required. Um, but when I worked, went to work for uh, Columbus State, hey, they were going to pay for me to get a doctorate, so I, oh. I, I undertook it. I never really thought I would pursue that, but uh, um, it just was an opportunity. And I'd already had my master's and my specialist, so um, it, it was just an opportunity. But my, uh, but my doctorate really helped me uh, beyond that. But, you know, in education, I tell people it's the degree helps you because it's just that milestone to get the position. Yeah. But uh, a master's degree and a specialist degree, they don't really teach you what you need to know um, to be a leader. You've got to have that real experience and you've yeah. got to have those real leadership skills. Right. And more than anything, my time in the army and my time in the regiment prepared me to be an educational leader. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. And then for everybody if watching or listening, um, Justin is on the mentor list for three Rangers organization, Mike, Mike Hall. And mm-hmm. I know he would, if you, we got anybody out there, Ranger specific, service specific, Absolutely. that want to know more about yep. his path and how to get there. I know we could, we could link you guys up. So, but uh, feel free to reach out and we can get you guys linked in. So yep. transition from your education stuff to just being a father. Right. Right. So, uh, how old are your kids now? Um, one of my kids is, let me, th- let me see. My oldest is 33. Okay. And my daughter is 23. So grandkids? Yeah, I got two grandkids. They both go to Mulberry Creek. Right. And, uh, um, one's in fourth grade and one's in kindergarten. Yeah. So were you the, how old were your kids when you transitioned out of service? Uh, let's see. Um, Madison, gee, probably f- five or six. Okay. Yeah, five or six, and, and then my son was probably a teenager at the time. Okay. Yeah, so that, you know, separating out of service unexpectedly with a wife and kids, it's uh, it, it, with no plan. Right. It's it's stressful, to say the least. Talk about vulnerability. Yeah, talk about <laughs> vulnerability. Uh, but it was a humbling experience, and, uh, you know, it, you, you got to that point where you just had to do what you had to do. Yeah. 
Um, I still had a couple years. I had some college before I went in the military, and I still had a couple years to finish my degree. So, you know, we just buckled down, and, you know, I worked several different jobs while I went to school um, to get to that point where I, I could graduate. You know, I worked on a landscaping crew. Uh, I delivered pizza. Um, <laughs> I did all kinds of, I, I did all kinds of things just to, just to make it through that period yeah. of time to bridge that gap. So I'm, I'm eternally grateful for my wife. Um, you know, I don't know where I'd be without her, right. um, supporting me through that time, uh, because it was, it was tough. Yeah. I yeah, can imagine. Yep. So, were you, did you teach your kids ever? Were you the principal for your kids? Yeah, actually I was, uh, I was teacher, uh, I was a teacher at uh, Rothschild middle school and actually, uh, it was more convenient for my son just to go to the school yeah. that I was a teacher at. He didn't particularly care for it <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, yeah. because, you know, you can't get away with anything yep. when, you're, when your dad works there. That's and right. then my daughter was, um, she was in seventh grade when I was the assistant principal over here at the middle school. And at first she, uh, didn't want me to, oh. to be there. Um, <clears throat> But then when I left, I left mid-year there to go to Mulberry Creek to be principal, and she didn't want me to leave because she used my uh, office as her personal locker. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's good. So, kids have moved on now. What advice would you give to the like the young dads out there? What's a, what's what's some of the keys of being a being a parent? Just you know, be present with your family. Yeah, be present with your family. You know, wake wake up every morning with a with an attitude of, you know. I didn't mean to rhyme this, and it was not, was not my intended pun. An attitude with gratitude. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, you know, I tell people every every day when they ask me how you doing, I'm like, well, I got up this morning. That's right. I can make something out of that. Yeah. And uh, every everything else is, uh, you know, good. Um, you know, I tell people too, and I, I've quit using this term in educational circles. But when people say, you know, how you doing, or you know, hey, we're having a bad day or something, I I used to say, you know, nobody's shooting at us. That's so, right. So today's a good day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I've heard that many, many times. Yeah, so I've, well. I've kind of quit using that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So in the education realm, you know, I, you get them when they're coming in the high school and all that age, and then right when they get, I get a lot of kids coming into the service that are 18, 19, 20 years old. You'll hear the stuff like the kids today, this generation. I don't believe it personally. No, I, I don't either. I always think it's the previous generation's fault or. They're hold. They're it's on us yeah. to train them and put and steal the right values and principles into them. Uh, I think we have some really bright kids out there that mm -hmm. actually hold us more accountable than than. I, I remember when I was younger in the army and I told a kid, "Hey, go f dig a hole." Mm -hmm. He went and dug the hole. Yeah. And then at some point it switched and he said, "Why?" And it really made me mad at first. But yeah. then I just realized he just was just wanted to mm -hmm. know because mm -hmm. information is so accessible right. now. What's your thoughts on the kids? kids today well I, I i never wanted to sound like that old curmudgeon <laughs> that's right you know these kids today yeah. um or you know get off my grass those kind of things um you know kids are kids yeah. and i don't know that there ever was the good old days right i, I think agree. the good old days may be a myth um kids are kids and people are people and um but the, but there are some differences in kids today and that difference is we're dealing with um Digital natives yeah. is what we call them. The kids today cannot remember a time that there wasn't a cell phone or a laptop or a or a, or a screen of some type, an yeah. iPad, like we do. So yeah. that right there, I think, is a a divide that we have, yep. um, and an understanding uh, that we need to bridge. Uh, but I believe that people have the the same desires that they always have, and that's to be um, you know have their needs met. Um, and to feel that they have a purpose and to feel that they are accepted. And, um, yeah, there's some differences in kids today and how we grew up, but we as educators have to learn to react and adjust to the kids, not ask the kids to adjust to us. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of arguments out there, but I've just found that it's e easier to be responsive to the kids and their needs and the way they communicate rather than trying to have them um, communicate in a, really a foreign language yeah. in some, in some instances. Uh, but yeah, I think our kids today have such potential yeah. and it's just, in, it's, it's important that we have the right educational structures and support um, that go even beyond the classroom yeah. um, to help these kids reach their, their full potential. Yeah. I think part of an educational leader's job is not just to educate kids, but to educate, help teachers be lifelong learners, yeah. to be lifelong learners ourselves, and to help 
help parents learn. Yeah. Um, some of our biggest barriers are parents that don't understand what's going on in our schools. And if we could bridge that communication gap, I think we'd have a lot more people on board um, going in a common direction as to what we want for our for our kids um, from their education. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's funny, the, the generation today, you know, you're, you're a former fires guy, so you're – you're good. You understand radios and communications. I'm an 11 Bravo infantry guy. <laughs> give me the radio class. You've got to give it to me 10 times. But now you get a kid in there, you mm-hmm. give him a, a radio. Yep. And before the class is even over, he's got the thing figured out. Yep. You know, he's telling me things that I didn't even know about the device and stuff. Yep. So there's, it's just, it's just different. Mm-hmm. It's not right or wrong. In my opinion, it's just different. You've got to learn how to leverage their capabilities. To, yeah. And what I tell, what I tell teachers and parents and educational leaders is we're preparing kids for a, for a future. We can't even, conceptualize yet yeah um we don't know what the realities are going to be when these kids graduate from high school we don't know what the job markets are going to be we don't know what the technology is going to be it's evolving so fast it's it's a it's a big uh endeavor just to keep up with it yeah um so you know teach them to be responsible citizens teach them to be kind and loving people um you know teach them the value and benefits of hard work yeah um, let them see and grow from uh, not just the benefits of their hard work, but from their mistakes. Yeah. Uh, mistakes aren't fatal in most cases. Um, and uh, I just think we need to reconceptualize some of the things that we try to do in schools yeah. and, and how we approach education. There are some basics that we need to stick with. Um, and I think there are some ethics and some um, standards and uh, things that we need to adhere to. Um, but to communicate it in a different way that these kids understand, I think is most important. Yeah. So I, I'll ask you there. So we do, we change and iterate more rapidly today's society and things are changing. So as an educator, how do you try to keep up with that and lead through such dynamic change? And then you throw COVID on top of that. How, I mean, just from your seat, how, how do you handle all that? How do you lead through that type of change? Well, I'll tell you one leader can't do it all. And so those days of the uh, the one figurehead charismatic leader, I think, are over. Yeah. Um, I I subscribe to a theory of distributed leadership, and distributed leadership is simply organizations are such complex organisms, yeah. and change is coming so rapidly now. One one person can't manage all of those systems and everything that happens in that organization. So everybody from the leader down is at some point in that organization both a leader and a follower and there's hundreds and thousands of different situations that you find yourself in so sometimes you're a follower sometimes you're a leader so you have to understand the context of the situation and where your role is in that moment so sometimes you're the follower sometimes you're the leader so what i've what i've tried to do is just be a 360 degree leader yeah and there's a great book by john maxwell the 360 degree leader. And I think it fits with distributed leadership. You know, we lead our subordinates, obviously, but we also should be leaders to our peers and leaders to our, um, to the leaders, to our bosses, um, so to speak. Um, but I think that's the only way to survive that rapid change that we're encountering in, in education. Um, you know, that's the only way to streamline bureaucracy. That's the only way to, um, manage and communicate and hear different viewpoints um we, we've been very we've been very fortunate here in harris county to have kind of a homogenous mm-hmm. um county and uh, but as this area grows people that haven't always been in harris county come here with different viewpoints yeah you have to be responsive to that um in uh in the school district and so communication is a big part of it communication is a big part of it um just letting people know what you're doing and why you're doing it um, often is enough, yeah. um, even if they disagree with you. Um, but being open to being open, being vulnerable yeah. <laughs> to hear other viewpoints and, right. and hear people's needs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was going to ask you there. So in your position, you've got to have thick skin, right? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, there was this, something went around the other day. I saw Dr. Finney tagged on it about a hundred thousand times with some of the stuff that he deals with, but how, what's, what's the approach that you take 
leading where you're at, all the feedback that you get, all the good ideas that you get from people. And, and just what's as a senior in that position, it doesn't matter if you're in education or not, you're going to have to deal with, with people's and complaints and, and communication. What, how do you handle? All well, that? first of all, I don't, t- I try not to take it personally. That's right. It, it's hard. It's hard not to take it personally sometimes, especially when you're personally attacked or yeah. personally confronted. Uh, but I've learned the hard way <laughs> to, <laughs> to avoid that. But um, like I said, people just want to be heard. Yeah. They just they just want to know that you're listening to them, um, and you might not agree with them, and you might not even make a decision and that, that goes in the direction that they um, think you should go. But um, just knowing that they've been heard, I think goes a goes a long way. Yeah. And and keeping those um, keeping those channels of communication open, because. We learn from we learn from different people, right. and we don't we don't always make the best decision. And um, you know, when you get it wrong, say you got it wrong, and and commit to doing what's right. That's right. Um, and so just just being that um, open, um, vulnerable yeah. um, organization um, that 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 people know and trust that you're going to. Um, do what's in the best interest to the best of your ability. And I, you know, I think that trust comes with just, um, knowing people knowing that, that you're going to make the, the, the decision that's in the best interest of the kids. Right. That's really the what collective they want. Yeah. The whole, yeah. Yeah. I think you're, and I think you said something owning your bad decisions mm-hmm. or owning what was I've more, you know, it's yep. a saying in the, in the army, you know, you're responsible for what you do and what you fail to do. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if more people would take responsibility for what they failed to do and yep. just own it, we'd be in a better spot. Mm-hmm. Cause that opens that lines of yep. communications in there. So move Harris County. You've seen this place change. Yes, I've, only, I've been here for four years and I can't believe the yep. amount of change in it. Uh, we fell in love with it when we first moved up here and we've been all over the place. Great community great schools the school the, everybody comes here for the schools right um just what's your perspective on harris county you've been here for 20 plus years yeah we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of changes and it seems like the changes are coming more rapidly um well the, the biggest thing like i said is we've got a more diverse population now uh people coming from all over the world yeah especially military people you know coming in and bringing a different perspective uh to what we've seen um you know and then trying to manage the change that we know is coming, yeah. uh, because this this growth we're experiencing in Harris County is uh, we don't see a we don't see an end to it in the <laughs> near future. So how do you how do you preserve that great part of Harris County that that small town feel that great school district um, those perks and and benefits and that culture that people really want to be a part of? How do you preserve the past and meet the challenges of the future? It it, it takes a lot of planning. It yeah. takes a lot of um, being strategic with your decisions and your resources and trying to get a vision and a mission on paper yeah. um, that points you in that direction mm-hmm. and staying on that, staying on that path with all of the competing um, yeah. interests yeah. Um, and then still doing it in a way where you're being responsive to the people. Yeah. And um, I always say people before programs um, and people before progress and um but it's it's a challenge to to put all of that together and uh, maintain the positive direction that uh, we need to have in this organization because we do enjoy the trust and um, of of the community and we don't take that for granted and we want to make sure we maintain that trust. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think that's why I believe military leaders would be so good in school because you have to plan for something you cannot predict just like any military operation and then you have to fight the fight and not the plan and Mm -hmm. when as it changes and you have to be resilient and you have to act on your toes and i think that's why people translate so good into this and that's why i invite anybody that's transitioning out of the military if you've got a desire to work with kids and young people and you've got a desire to serve Education is a great place to do it yeah. um, because you already have the skills that most people going into teaching wish they had. Yeah. And that's the ability to plan. That's ability to work in high, high tempo operations. Um, no two days in a school are the same. Um, your ability to plan, your ability to um, um, react to contact, that's right. <laughs> so that's to right. speak. Yeah. Um, things change on a dime. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, those are all such great skills to have. I, I've always just, um, you know, a classroom of kids, I just always looked at that as my platoon. That's right. Now, I have to say that cautiously <laughs> because you can't you can't treat um, a, a classroom full of kids like you do a, a platoon of soldiers. You wouldn't last very Obviously, long. Obviously, you don't last very long. <laughs> But just managing that group and looking after their needs and taking care yeah. of them and um, teaching them yeah. and understanding that here are our objectives and here are our standards and I'm going to make sure they know yeah. these standards because, you know, just like battle drills and things like that, the soldiers needed to know. There are skills that kids are learning in school that they need to know. Yeah. And literally, where their life depended on it, knowing their battle drills, these kids' lives depend on what they're getting from us in education. Yeah, yeah so I... I I'm a volu- I coach football here. Mm-hmm. I'm on the sports board here. Uh, I just educate. That time at school might be the only structure some of these kids mm-hmm. have in their mm-hmm. whole lives. And that's what I tell when I'm coaching. I was like, this hour we have with these kids might be the best hour they have in their day. So yep. we have to maximize it and take advantage of it because we're not just training them to be football players. That's easy. We're training yep. them to be the next leaders of our country. Absolutely. So. And they're, you know, their lives are going to be better for it and our lives are going to be yeah, better absolutely. for it. And you, you're, you're absolutely correct when you say – you. You know, that might be the only positive influence they have in that day. And some of these kids come from such dire circumstances that you just wouldn't even believe. Yeah. Some of the things that they come to school with, um, um, carrying uh, with them every day as far as emotional baggage and what they're going through at home. But, um, yeah, it's – it's. I tell people that um, they're depending on us. Yeah. And they're literally trusting us with the lives of their of their most precious yep. – uh, thing in the whole world and that's their children yeah and uh you know sometimes when teachers get frustrated about some kids and how they behave i'm like you know they're not they're not keeping their best kids at home they're sending (laughs) us the best they have yeah and i I just look at public education as the great equalizer and I, i see it being even more important as we see all the social changes that we're going through in our country um you know public education is the great equalizer yeah so Part of being in, you know, I'm 20, I've been in the Army for 20 years. One of the best things in there is when I get to watch somebody's career progress mm-hmm. and I see them come, become platoon sergeants and yep. first sergeants and now sergeant majors. It's probably the same with some of these kids that you've been around the last 20 years watching them. That's another aspect of fulfilling. What's some of the stories you have there? Oh, yeah. Some of the kids that I taught um, uh, at Rothschild Middle School down in Columbus, you know, they're grown adults now. Yeah. Um, one, one story in particular Um, well, two stories, actually, I was interviewing, I was setting up interviews for a a school counselor at Mulberry Creek and, um, I'm lining up all the resumes and things. And I come across a name of a young lady that I thought I recognized, but it had been a long time. And I'm like, I know this name for some reason. And, um, set up the, scheduled the interview and went out to, to meet her and sitting right there was one of my former students. Um, so she was applying for the counselor's position at Mulberry Creek and I won't go into the whole background, but there were challenges. Yeah. Um, I remember back in those days and, um, here she was sitting with a master's degree, um, applying for a job. And, um, it it was just gratifying to see that, um, take place. I don't know. I hope I had a, I hope I had at least a small part in that. Um, there was another young lady that I, um, taught and coached, um, throughout middle school um, that came to be a, uh, a really great special education teacher. And uh, to see her come up and go into education as well was just very gratifying. Yeah. So I still see these people, these kids are, I call them kids, yeah, but they're know, grown right? now. I still see them around Columbus all the time. <laughs> and it's just great to, to um, run into them and see them and yeah. remember and just see how well they're doing now. Yeah. 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 I, I, that's, I mean, just yep. another benefit of being in that, in that yep, space. Absolutely. So I have it here, wrap up here. I have the question written down. Tell me about Lieutenant Finney. Okay. Because I just assumed, again, he was an officer, but he's one of us. He's me. Uh, if you could go back, right, private yeah. Finney, right, what what advice would you give him going for, you know? Well, it's, I think it's kind of where I started. Um, you know, this, this conversation was live in the moment. Yeah. Live in the moment, but, you know, know that there's a future. Um be thankful. Learn everything you can right now. Um, you can't, you know, you can't dwell on your mistakes because you can't go back and change them. Learn from them. Um, but but live in that moment. Appreciate the people that you're with now. Your family. Yeah. 
um, the people that you can learn from, your mentors. Um, there are so many mentors I look back on through my military career and into my education that, you know, I always tried to take something from each leader that I came in contact with. And, you know, guys like, and, and I don't know if you know these guys, but Bobby Lane, Kevin Martin, um, Hugh Rhodes, those kind of guys that were, you know, larger than life to <laughs> me at the time. I still dwell on those things that those guys taught me. Yeah. And, and I still apply those things that those guys taught me. So, Soak up everything you can, become a lifelong learner, but understand that there's going to be a time where you're going to have to apply those things too, and life's going to change for you. Right. And just be ready for those changes. That's right. Yeah. Just be ready. Well, Justin, Dr. Finney, I really appreciate you coming on here. Uh, I know somebody out there, if it's only one person that listens that wants to go to the education and they learn something, this, is, this half hour has been worth it, but I'm sure more will. I uh, appreciate it. I appreciate everything you do for this community, you did for your country, taking care of our kids while we were deployed the last 20 years. Um, and uh, I just thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. This is this has been really fun. It this is. is this has been really exciting. And thanks for what you're doing, reaching out to people. I I, I know you're reaching a lot of people. I'm sure. And uh, yeah, if I can, if anybody reaches out to you and I can help in any way, or if they have any questions, um, I'd I'd be happy to sit down and, and talk to anybody. I tell people if I can do it. Yeah. Anybody can do That's it. That's what I tell them. I That's tell them all the time. If I can do it, anybody yeah, can yeah. do it. Yeah. You know, kid from outside Amarillo yep. and, and Pie Town, New Mexico. Yep. You know, yep. uh, if we can do this, anybody can do it. So for all out there watching, be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and uh, leave your comments and feedback, and I appreciate it. And we'll check in with you uh, on the next episode.